ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. And um, if the background looks a little bit different and unfamiliar to you, uh, I don't blame you because it is different and unfamiliar. I'm on a ship, not just any ship. I'm on the only Ocean Liner in service, uh, the Queen Mary 2. I'm here with my mum and it's a lovely kind of dream come true holiday for us both. And we've been having a great time, but today it's time for a little bit of channel Q and A. I asked you guys if you had any questions for me that I could answer. And turns out you had a lot. I don't think I'm going to be able to get through all of them. I'm going to pick a few at random, uh, starting with my patrons and channel members, and then kind of work my way down. So let's see what we've got. JLB Flix says, have you ever considered doing a video or two talking about fictional ocean liners and other craft and some of their background in both production and real world inspirations? Not really. I mean, um, it kind of feels bad. I feel a bit guilty. There are so many real ships from history and real real craft that deserve so much attention. Like the Aquitania, that thing had a crazy long service career and there's really not much out there about it. So I'd love to do a little bit more on ships that existed. The closest I ever get is when I do my alternate history, you know, what if Titanic didn't sink. Um, probably the most egregious twisting of history I've ever done was when I did my what if Britannic didn't sink in, in World War One video. Uh, that was all made up. It was based on some real world disasters, but uh, that was a lot of fun. And I enjoy doing those, but I do feel guilty doing it sometimes because there's some real disasters and real ships out there that deserve a lot of attention. So I want to cover those first before I do any like fictional ocean liner stories. Momo Hanukai says, why are you so handsome? I'll, I'll thank my mum for you. Um, for real though, my question is, what is your schedule when making videos? Do you have a break, etc.? It baffles me. I have three channels and a Discord server. That's probably me though. Yeah, I mean, it is a lot of work. So the videos are uh, a lot of writing. It, it takes a lot of time to write these these scripts for my videos. They all need to be researched and backed up with, you know, as much fact as I can get. The scripts range from about 2,000 to 5,000 words, and I try to do about two a week. So if you can imagine, um, you know, like two university essays every week, of about, say, split the difference, like three and a half thousand words. It's just a ton of work, and then to uh, animate them and film and do the whole thing. So I really enjoy doing it. It's not hard work when it's, I mean, it is hard work, but it's not, it doesn't feel it when you enjoy it and it's your passion. But there, definitely there are times where I'm kind of just sitting there. It's like 3 a.m. I'm waiting for a video to slowly upload onto the internet. And I'm just thinking, um, oh man, why couldn't I have got this done sooner? It is a lot of work. The second channel is kind of for fun. I don't really, um, need to do any like research or anything for that one that's just me messing around and playing video games and having fun i enjoy doing it you know it's worth it to see you guys the comments seeing people engaging with it and really enjoying it i mean the, the most work i've ever put into a video was my laconia cruise ship fire video that was like a whole month straight of really hard work animating that thing but uh, it was so worth it just seeing people responding saying what bits of the video they they felt a reaction to and some people crying in certain bits and um, it sounds a little bit twisted, but that's exactly what I'm going for. You want to get some kind of reaction from your audience, if you will. So uh, yeah, it's a lot of work, but coffee gets me through. Airwicker says, is there any ocean liner you don't like and why? That's a good one. I really don't like picking favorites and I especially don't like picking least favorites because all ocean liners are beautiful in their own way. I mean, even the um, ugly ones. <laughs> and there were a few ugly ones. If I had to pick one that I didn't like, uh, it's really tough. You've put me out on the spot with that one. The, um, the, <laughs> I'm gonna get really chewed out in the comments for these ones. Uh, the Ball and Trio I've always thought were, um, very industrial looking from the outside. Magnificent interiors on the inside, but still extremely Teutonic and probably not that well designed and constructed. I know they had issues with center of gravity and rolling and then um, the shell plating was tearing and so when you couple that with the fact that from the outside they look a little boxy and not at all uh, as elegant and yacht-like as say the Greyhounds, Mauritania, Lusitania, the Olympic. It's probably my pick for, for a liner that is getting towards you know maybe I don't like the way they look I still love them though, so that's the closest you're going to get for an ocean liner I, I don't like. Alan says, I'm new here, so I don't know if you already talked about that, but I'm currently building the Lego Titanic and was wondering what are your thoughts about it? And thanks for your amazing videos. Thank you, Alan. 
The LEGO Titanic's great. I mean, they did a pretty good job of getting it fairly close uh, to the real thing as far as its looks and its design. I think it's really impressive considering the thing's made up of like tiny bricks. And it's huge. I saw one uh, recently for the first time and it was monstrous. Um, it's expensive, but not everybody has the time or the effort available to put together like the Trumpeter 1-200 scale Titanic. So if you want a quick and easy giant model of the Titanic, that will be a conversation starter when people come around. Uh, the LEGO Titanic is the one. And um, no, this video was not sponsored by LEGO. But if they do want to sponsor me, get in touch. My email is in my bio. <laughs> I wanted to kind of make it myself and then like live stream it and do like a build the Titanic with Mike type situation. Um, maybe that could be fun. Maybe we can do that. Matthew says, which do you consider to be the first ocean liner? And why is the answer SS Great Britain? He's Answer that one for me. When are you going to cover the Great Eastern? Yes, she is the red-headed stepchild <laughs> of the ocean liner community, uh, but she could use some love too. No offense to any uh, red-headed stepchildren out there. We, we, know, we know we love you. The Great Eastern is a spectacular ship. For those of you who may not be totally familiar with its story, it was designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who was a fascinating character from the 19th century. A brilliant industrialist, engineer, um, really cut his teeth on designing railways and bridges and then just kind of struck out and started designing ships and was doing a spectacular job of it all the way through and designed what was then by far the biggest ship in the world. It was a monumental step up in terms of tonnage and length and it was probably just too ahead of its time. It was big, the public laughed at it, they thought it was too big, why would a ship need to be that big? And um, it really didn't earn its, earn its keep. And the, you know, the project ended in kind of, not, not, total total failure but it never got to do its intended run which was to run from Britain to Australia and became a cable laying vessel. It's a ship I've always wanted to talk about in more depth. I've always wanted to draw it. I haven't got around to it. There's so many ships to cover but the Great Eastern is one that I'd, I'd love to cover. The Great Britain is yeah, certainly my pick for a um, contender for first ocean liner. The purpose of an ocean liner being to maintain a regular passenger schedule not unlike a bus. This is a transatlantic bus. And in order to do that, you need to have steam propulsion or some kind of engine that you know, regardless of the conditions, you're going to be able to kind of plow through it. And um, the Great Britain, I think, was that ship. Christopher says, aside from the Titanic, uh, which maritime disaster from history are you most fascinated by and why? There are so many, but the one that really grabbed me, and um, it certainly isn't the most uh, costly in terms of lives lost, but I think it is one of the most dramatic, and that was the fire on board the Laconia. Um, there have been other cruise ship fires, other ocean liner fires. But the Laconia disaster always really fascinated me, purely because of the drama of these people dancing in the ballroom directly above the flashpoint from this fire. It was just unbelievable. They were there and the fire was burning the ship directly beneath their feet and these people you know rushing to the stern of the ship and hoping that you know they found refuge but then the fire kind of chasing them and they had to jump or or burn it's really a fascinating disaster so i was uh, really happy to make the video about it there wasn't uh, uh you know thousands of casualties like the, the wilhelm gustloff or other liners like that but um it's been forgotten to history largely now but a really really um dramatic story and very very interesting because it shows that even long after the era of ships like Titanic and, and Lusitania, there were, there were things where complacency crept in. In this case, it was the safety features of this ship. The davits weren't really checked. They didn't lower the boats and they kind of got gunked up with rust and, and paint and half the boats couldn't be launched and the other ones that could be launched were spilling into the ocean. And absolute disaster. So yeah, that was one that really always piqued my interest. York says, these are all patrons by the way, so thank you for joining the Ocean Liner Designs Patreon. York says, when did you first uh, begin making art? And what inspires you to begin making art of ships in such detail? It was my dad's birthday. Um, I've been doing this a long time, but I used to use Microsoft Paint. And some of my earliest um, ship drawings are heavily pixelated, but they were done in paint. I was really proud of them at the time, especially the Titanic and the Olympic. I put hundreds of rivets on them. And yeah, they looked really good. Uh, not bad for a you know, 17 year old who should have been doing schoolwork. <laughs> but I made the jump to Photoshop. Um, I'd experimented a little bit with it in 2014. I'll see if I can find one of the earliest, earliest things I ever did on Photoshop, which was just trace my paint drawing of the Titanic in Photoshop. And then for my dad's birthday in 2018, he was turning 70. 
I didn't know what to get him. And I figured, um, you know, I can kind of do what I've been doing as a hobby in paint. I'm doing it in Photoshop and do this big drawing of his, um, of the ship that carried him to Australia, which was the Strathnaver, Piendo Ocean Liner. And um, I thought, you know, I'll put as much detail in it as I can. And I did. And I did it very, very quickly. And the first edition of this drawing is so undetailed. You know, there's things missing. It's very, very, very basic. But I remastered it. It's very interesting comparing a later version of that drawing with the first one when I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but the idea for me behind the detail, like what's the point of putting all this stuff in these drawings, is something happened yesterday that perfectly illustrates this. That uh, I was up on the deck here on the Queen Mary 2 with some new friends that I made and we were going to watch the sunset and they said, yeah, come around here, we know a spot, we call it the good spot. And they took me to these big wooden crates that hold um, some of the like deck chairs and the, the cushions for the deck chairs. And they're huge and um, they sat up on it. And I said, why is this the good spot? And they said, because there's this pipe here and you can lean on it, like sit back and lean on it and watch the sunset. And um, what's funny is when I draw the Queen Mary 2, which is something I plan on doing, I will add that pipe, you know, that pipe will be there. It's purely technical, it's drainage. It runs, I think, from the scuppers up above and drops the water down and out the side of the ship. But that pipe has a kind of like an emotional connection now that if I looked at the drawing in future, I'd see that pipe and I'd think I'd remember that moment of sitting there with my friends watching the sunset. And that's what it's all about. If you put a, you know, a piece of machinery there, someone as a kid when they were emigrating to Australia might have sat on it or their dad might have, you know, picked them up and put them on it while they went and did something. And it just jogs memories. And I think the more detailed the drawings are, um, the more emotional the reaction uh, will be from the person who is looking at it if they had a connection with that ship. If they don't have a connection with that ship, the detail just looks great. <laughs> so, so why not? Why not? James says, I have uh, been watching you since your first videos. What encouraged you to turn your hobby into a YouTube channel and stick with uploading content? Yes, yes, it's a funny one because this was really meant to be just like a, you know, the drawings are the main thing here. I do these drawings of ships, and then I make YouTube videos occasionally just talking about what I put into the drawing. That was the first video I ever did about the Lusitania was, hey guys, here's a tour of my drawing. But then something kind of changed. I thought, um, you know, I've got a lot of interest in the Titanic and I knew a few things about it and I thought I could do videos about things that I kind of thought were common knowledge or common, commonly known, um, but that kind of there was a lot of misinformation about on the internet, you know, why the Titanic's funnels collapsed, I think was one of the earliest videos that I did in that style, and also what happened to the Olympic after the Titanic sank. And they were always in line with this kind of my mindset when it comes to drawing the ship's technical, you know, how they worked, how they sank. And so then the videos, um, which were here, started to overtake the drawings in terms of, in terms of importance and, um, you know, an interest from the public. So really now my business is a, is a, you know, video making business, not so much a drawing business anymore, which is a bit sad, but, um, the videos that I do make, the reason I stick with it is because I just really enjoy making them. Um, especially the ones where I can get a little more cinematic with them, less so, you know, the, the just kind of like rattling off facts and more getting very creative. I love thinking a bit like a filmmaker and, and you know, making the audience feel something. And you'll always see, I call them uh, like heartbreak moments. You'll see there's always little moments in some of those videos that are designed to just kind of like send a chill up the audience's uh, collective spine. And there are a couple that I put in, usually there'll be like a pause with some kind of audio cue, something a little spooky to make you think, oh, that's, uh, that's creepy or that's sad or something like that. So yeah, I, I really enjoy being more creative with my videos like that. All right, what have we got here? There are so many, there are so many questions. All right, let's see if we can get through. Um, Alexis says, have you ever been to Belfast to see the old Highland Wolf shipyard, Titanic Museum? I have, I have. It's a dream of mine to go, but I was curious if it would be worth a standalone trip or should I look into other things in the area as well? Totally look into other things in the area. Belfast is a very vibrant city. It's got a lot, a ton of history, a lot of it quite troubled, but it's also very, um, accommodating they love people who visit and um they loved me because i was from australia <laughs> there was like so much they were just kind of like lavishing um welcomings unto me which was lovely and um, definitely go to belfast castle it looks out over the um the mouth of the river lagan as it drains into belfast lock 
and um, beautiful, beautiful view of the city. And yeah, try some of the food and just kind of get out a little bit into the country around Belfast. Um, you can spend a few days in Belfast easily and, and really enjoy yourself. So um, yeah, the Thompson Graving Dock is cool. The Titanic experience is cool. The Nomadic, the restored Nomadic is really, really cool. And that's definitely worth a trip. But the city itself is really nice. So to all my Belfast friends out there, hello. And thank you for accommodating me when I visited in 2018. Sean Steven says, do you think the fate of the White Star Line would have been different if none of the Olympic class trio had ever sunk? Now, that's a really good question. That's one I think about a lot. It's just interesting to me that um, the Cunard Line seemed to have a lot of political sway and, and close connection with the Admiralty. And that's very well demonstrated. Even though White Star Line ships carried troops through the, you know, the Boer War um, and obviously the First World War, Cunard was designing their ships with mounts for six inch guns to be used as you know, auxiliary cruisers right off the bat. And they did that in conjunction with the Admiralty. Um, Lusitania and Mauritania were designed to Admiralty spec, so they had very um, specifically designed engine and boiler rooms uh, well below the waterline with bulkheads and uh, coal bunkers facing um, towards the outside of the hull to kind of protect from you know, plunging fire from enemy, enemy warships. I don't think the White Star Line had that kind of close working relationship with the British government. They were, um, you know, American owned and they were just kind of, you know, fulfilling their own interests and they certainly volunteered ships to act as troop ships. But I think Cunard Line always had the closer relationship. So when it came to the time for a merger during the Great Depression, um, I feel like the White Star Line would have always been um, playing second fiddle to Cunard and the British government would have um, enforced that merger and Cunard I think would have always ended up with a uh, controlling interest in that. So I think it was always destined to kind of be the Cunard White Star Line because of that that ability and, and also the brilliant political play of Sir Percy Bates who was Cunard's chairman. I think he was just a, um, a great doer and mover and maneuverer politically and he was just able to get things done and I think that was the Cunard's secret weapon. Very good question. Raphael says, Hi Mike, it's going to be 23 years since the Baha Men asked the question, who let the dogs out? Have we ever come any closer to finding out who did? Uh, no, I don't. I think that one's still up in the air. On the Queen Mary 2, up on the top deck here, there are kennels and there is space for people to walk their dogs. I haven't gone up and let those dogs out yet. There are two little interesting things next to the kennels. There's a New York style uh, fire hydrant and a London style telephone or like lamp post. And um, that's for uh, American and British dogs to feel equally at home in case they wanted to um, walk around and uh, lift a leg on something. It'll let the dogs out, so to speak. Dwayven says, congratulations on passing 150,000 subscribers. Quite a milestone. Thank you, Dwayven. Hoping you can answer a question as an Australian. I expect you would know what the proper pronunciation is for Orchides. The Orient Liner Orchides. I've heard it pronounced two different ways and would love to know which is correct. I've always thought it was Orchides. Um, I don't know how else you'd say it. Orcades? <laughs> I think it's Orchides. Derpy Possum says, long time supporter of the channel, says, You're a sci fi writer. Okay. You've been tasked with coming up with a design for an interplanetary passenger spaceship, but you're really into classic ocean liners. So this kind of sounds like a Stephen Payne designer of the Queen Mary 2 type situation, but in the future. If given the opportunity to create this futuristic passenger spacecraft, which ocean liner uh, from history would you take the most inspiration from? Uh, probably the Normandy. The <laughs> I don't know why the Normandy seems to get so much hate in, in the ocean liner community, but the, um, the insane scale of its decks, like how wide these decks were and how like tall the ceilings were in a lot of these spaces. I think a space Normandy would be really cool. From a lot of angles, the Normandy kind of already looks a little bit futuristic. <laughs> Um, it was definitely ahead of its time, so I think, uh, I'm gonna say Space Norman, that's gonna be my pick. I think, like, replicating those, like, those giant interiors, but upscaling it even more, you know, not a two-story tall, but, like, six-story tall entranceway into a smoking lounge, um, would be really cool. Make it really gothic on the inside, so yeah, Space Normandy. Do you think, this is, uh, from Cooking with Sal Manella. Cooking with Sal Manella, what a, what a name. Do you think any more people would have actually gotten off Titanic if there were more lifeboats or would have confused the situation more trying to use the new Welland Davits untrained and resulted in more death? 
I can't say for certain it would have resulted in more death. I covered the um, topic of did Titanic actually carry enough lifeboats or not in another video and kind of touched on this answer. But I was thinking about this the other day and I realized that uh, if she was carrying more collapsible boats, like the two that she kept um, on the boat deck forward and then the two that she kept up on the officer's quarters, if she just had some more of those kind of on the roofs of some of those deck houses there, there was pretty much like plenty of space where they could have stowed some more. That definitely would have made a difference because we know that um, they would have just like floated off the ship and the buoyancy tanks in them would have meant they just would have floated there like barges and um, in theory you could have had like a dozen or more people who might have survived the night um, clinging to those. So say there was like six more of those boats, um, that's, that's a pretty decent amount of people who could have survived the night. I feel like full-size clinker-built lifeboats, those, you know, 30-foot boats, um, if they were still attached to their davits, would have been probably pulled under the ship, um, or pulled under with the ship when it was going down, and um, still more may have, yeah, may have kind of like broken loose down the deck. They, they didn't get time to lower all the boats, really. I mean, they were just lowering the very, very last of them when the water came up around their knees. So you're talking about um, a deck full of dozens of lifeboats. The interesting thing about these boats is that uh, if there was indeed a second row of lifeboats inboard, which was the original plan to have two rows, that would have meant that the, um, the lifeboats forward of the number two funnel, like around the middle of the ship forward, would have been almost useless because you couldn't load those boats really from the A-deck promenade efficiently because unlike Olympic, Titanic's A-deck promenade was completely plated over with these windows and they were having a really hard time opening those windows on the night of the sinking. And so you couldn't then, with a second row of boats, load those forward boats up from the boat deck and you couldn't load them up from the A-deck promenade. Um, and I feel like in the heat of the moment, they would have just abandoned those boats and started lowering aft at the back of the ship taking those lifeboats down to A deck and then trying to get people in it would have been a lot more uh, time consuming and I think a bit of a, um, a bit of an issue but if they had more collapsibles that would have been a different story I think if she was carrying more you would have had you know a couple hundred people uh, extra saved William says if you could preserve one liner and one warship from history which ones would you pick caveat is a ship that didn't sink due to accidents or wartime um, okay brilliant well if I could preserve uh, one liner from history it would be the Mauritania. I think the Mauritania, there was uh, something really charming about that ship. So much great history and so many really cool stories. And I would have loved to have seen it in real life and experienced traveling on an Atlantic Greyhound. That's what that type of liner was referred to. It was a express steamer designed for speed. And um, I just would have really enjoyed staying on it. So yeah, let's, you know, preserve the Mauritania. As far as warships, it's gotta be the war spite. It was a British uh, battleship, a, uh, a super dreadnought from the First World War that served all the way through to the Second World War and just had this insane history. And it's, uh, you know, devastating, criminal that they scrapped that ship. The British were so austere. Unlike the Americans who tried to preserve, like, literally every warship because they kind of could, um, the British were scrambling for money. And so the British government um, was not very emotional about their warships and unfortunately the beautiful old war spite which had done so much for the allied war effort uh, was scrapped and in fact my granddad when he was uh, about to land at normandy was parked in his troop ship just off the shore and they spent the afternoon watching the um i think it was the war spite and the rodney you know firing shell after shell miles inland to pound uh, german um positions way far away and in fact that actually flooded um, some of the tanks on the war spite's uh, starboard bow starboard side so that she was listing a little bit to get extra range out of those guns and she was firing up high into the sky and you imagine what that would have sounded like all day just boom, boom just huge uh, shells being fired um, so yeah having that little personal connection uh, i would have loved to have seen it and walked the decks of an actual dreadnought battleship Fortunately, we can probably get some understanding of what that would be like because uh, they're currently in the process of restoring the USS Texas, which is from around about the same era as the War Spite. Uh, she was built in 1912 and she's undergoing a complete refit. So that'd be very cool to walk the decks of that ship because it will um, be very, very similar to any, any warship of that era. Well, these have been really, really good questions. Um, there are so many more that I wanted to answer, but I've kind of run out of time. I might have to do a second Q&A video in the next couple of weeks using those same questions because there's about 
180 more that I haven't yet answered. I hope this has been a little bit interesting, give you some insight into what I do and why I do it. I think my favorite question was the, um, who let the dogs out one? <laughs> because I don't know. I still don't know. As always, ladies and gentlemen, stay safe, stay happy, and I will see you again next time.